This is the Grow Your Clinic podcast from Clinic Mastery. We help progressive health professionals to lead inspired teams, transform client experiences, and build clinics for good. Now, it's time to grow your clinic. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Grow Your Clinic podcast. I'm your host, Jack O'Brien, and it has been a whirlwind of activity here at the podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in once again. As you'll know, we have released a bunch of guest episodes recently. We had Emily Connett from Newcastle Creative Co., Damien Adler from Power Diary, and a stack of others. And today, we've got same, same, but different. We do have another guest, but this is a slightly different flavor of guest. And I can't wait for you to meet and listen to the incredible stories of Kate Heslop, who is our guest today. Kate, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Very excited to be here. Super stuff. Super. So Kate has been a part of our Clinic Mastery Business Academy and a graduate through the Academy, one of our first members actually, and continues to to strive ahead in leaps and bounds. It's, uh, it's actually quite inspiring to me, your story, Kate. But um, we're going to dive into your story of clinic growth and, and freedom and travel and what you've learned throughout your journey. Is that all right? Sounds good. Super. Before we get started... I have a couple of icebreaker questions for you. It's going to be rapid fire, whatever comes top of mind. Is that okay? Done. Super. Okay. What are you reading right now? I am rereading Radical Candor by Kim Scott. Um, Yes, I figured that it's worth a second look at. Why is that? Um, The first time I read it, I think I was overwhelmed with realising where I sat in the quadrant, if anyone's read it. Uh Um, And so I took more about me away from it. And this time I'd really like to take away how I can introduce Radical Candor to the team um, Mm -hmm. and we can use it in the clinic. Love it. Quickly then, where do you sit on the Care Personally Challenge Directly axes? Look, I'm ruinously empathetic, but very much trying to pursue Radical Candor on all fronts. Love it. Appreciate the, uh, the honesty straight, <laughs> straight off the bat. I love it. A bit of vulnerability, Brene Brown style. Who inspires you, Kate? Um, I've been thinking about who inspires me and I don't really have a specific person. Um, I think anyone who's willing to dive into small business is, is an inspiration, really. It's not easy. And I think, yeah, anyone who's willing to do it um, and hold on to it and continue pushing is definitely inspiring. Yeah, love it. What did you want to be growing up? And I love asking podiatrists this question uh, at the risk of offending our podiatrists. No one grows up wanting to cut toenails, but (laughs) what did you want to be growing up? Correct. Um, I didn't. Um, I wanted to be a forensic psychologist or a criminologist. That was my top two um, job aspirations. Yeah, right. Love it. And what's a motto you like to live by? I'm a big believer of everything happens for a reason and also uh, trust in the process of life is kind of more of a mantra, I guess, than a motto, but yeah, falls into that same category. Mm, I like it. I thought for a second you might have said your uh, your Instagram handle (laughs) is uh, simple. And actually, we might chuck it in at the start of the episode. Kate, uh, Kate, you lead Diamond Valley Foot and Ankle Clinic. uh, And if people want to check that out, we'll link it up later in the show where they can head to and uh what is your instagram handle if people are looking for life motto travel.eat.laugh.repeat travel eat laugh repeat uh you're all about the travel which we're going to dive into later so thank you for sharing that but let's uh let's have a bit of a fireside chat about the story of kate heslop uh Mm. you're a podiatrist yes why on earth did you decide to become a clinic owner as well as a podiatrist (laughs) Uh, I think it goes back to, I guess, deciding to pursue podiatry. It kind of was always, well, if I do podiatry, I'll have a clinic. That was always kind of what happened in my mind. Um, Yeah, my mum was a a physio. um, And I think that maybe had some undertone in why I decided to do podiatry. But I wanted to be able to have a job where I could work part time, but I guess earn potentially a full-time income to have a small family. My mum was at home two days a week with me, which I thought was awesome and I love our relationship. So I very much wanted to emulate that and I thought having a small business would be a good opportunity to do that. Mm, nice. And so you start your own clinic or buy someone else's? I bought a clinic that was running two days a week. Great. And so you bought it solo? Yes. Right. Nice. What was that first six months like? Uh, interesting. I kind of was just living off the smell of an oily rag, really. Go to work 
treat 15 patients a day. I was working another part-time job at that point in time as well. So that kind of kept me afloat while I found my feet, which was good. Um, but then, you know, more demand with the business, which is what you want, obviously. Mm -hmm. But um, so I just started opening up half days and full days as the demand came about. And yeah, the six first six months went really quickly um, and was very overwhelming. And yeah, I soon realized I had a bit of a glorified job at that point. <laughs> and uh, it, it was probably like most of us, myself included, a job where you worked long hours, probably didn't get paid enough and didn't have enough holidays, right? Correct. <laughs> and so how far into your business ownership journey was the first hire, your first team member joined? Oh, um, I did what most people do and started trying to get, I guess, a, a locum or a subcontractor to, I guess, mitigate my risk more than anything. Right. Um, it seemed pretty scary to hire an employee. So I just went for the contractor option. That would have been two and a half years in. Okay. So you, you chugged away solo for quite a period. Yes, a very long time. I had no receptionist. I was everything. It was me, me and me. <laughs> what are some of the skills that you learned early on that you're really grateful came to you? Obviously, you're probably a good podiatrist. We can assume as much. But outside of podiatry, <laughs> what were some of the skills you learned? I Multitasking. I became very, very good at multitasking. Um, sometimes that's not a positive, but definitely became good at juggling a lot of things. And I think that saying of give a busy person something to do and it'll get done. I was very good at getting everything done, but I was definitely burning the candle at both ends because of that constant need to be working. Like you said, it, it was you know, virtually 24 seven. You'd go to sleep dreaming about it or you'd you know, be up late working on your laptop and doing letters to GPs and trying to do you know, really poor low grade marketing as well. It was just, yeah, it was, a, it was an ongoing slog. Yeah, okay. That's a, that's a really good picture. So you were a pretty young podiatrist, bought a little clinic and slaved away for a couple of years solo. Mm -hmm. We're going we're gonna to go through the journey, but fast forward to now. What does it look like now? Now we are in our own freestanding building clinic. Um, we have a team of three other podiatrists and myself um, and two admin superstars. So the business is very, very different to what it was. And yeah, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. And allows you to travel just a little bit here and there? Just a little bit. Yep. Yep. How f you've just got back from a trip recently. How long was that? Um, it was nearly nine weeks um, so overseas. Good. Yep. Yeah. What, which countries? Oh, um, Spain, Morocco, Malta, Jordan, Turkey, and Egypt. Wow. Mm. I am jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's awesome to know where it's at. So let's, let's dive through some of the steps and the, the journey along the way. How did you grow and add extra practitioners, locations? What were some of the things that worked really well for you? I, I think going straight into an employee rather than contracting, I did a couple of, um, hired a few contractors and I just didn't feel like I could, I don't know, get them to do the things that, you know, you need someone that's working with you to do. And so that was probably my biggest false start as right. a business owner. And so as soon as I did, actually look at employing, which without plugging Clinic Mastery was definitely um, a good push from the team at CM. Um, and when that happened, everything changed. I learned a lot even after that. I mean, I'm always forever learning as a business mm, owner as um, and as a leader. Um, I think that's a never ending journey, but sure. first time around, I was very much like, what hours suit you? What works for you? And now I've realized that you know, as much as autonomy and those kinds of things are really great, a lot of people need some direction and they need a leader to follow. So mm. I learned very quickly that being everyone's best friend is not always the way to go. I'm a people pleaser by nature. And as a business owner and a leader, you kind of have to be able to balance that. Mm. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, wow. That's an, a really important lesson to learn, yeah, to, to overcome some of those fears of your, of your own insecurities and then working out what's going to be a win-win. It sounds like you were with your perhaps earlier hires, creating wins for them, perhaps at your own expense. Correct, definitely. Yeah, right. Okay. And how about attracting new clients and actually growing their caseload? How do you, how do you grow a clinic? So we, 
I guess, held on to what we had and tried to move people across to them rather than getting new patients in at the start, which um, didn't really work that well. Um, patients generally liked seeing who they were already seeing. And so we did a really big social media push at the start. So it came hand in hand, my first employee with um, a February Instagram challenge from the team at CM, which we mm -hmm. grabbed with both hands and run with. And it was kind of just a really good start for our new team member to take hold of, you know, social media and realize the content that we can create can create some really nice um, new patients walking in the door and right. kind of less lottery of who comes in and more our ideal patient who mm. we want coming into the clinic. Yeah, right. That's awesome. What about the, the other stuff in and around running a business? What, what systems, processes are you really glad that you put in place early on? Our HQ, so um, our kind of intranet at the clinic, has been worth its weight in gold. Like I, I remember so well um, moments when, you know, you'd have worked for hours and hours trying to fill this database of information with how to turn on the steriliser, how to, you know, record a phone message, how to do all of these things. And it was really disheartening when the team would not look at it um, mm -hmm. after you'd spent all of this time at it. But once I managed to get the team to use it effectively, it, that's essentially what has made traveling for me so easy because it's, it's all there for the team to find. So that was a massive one. And obviously that holds all of our policies, procedures and systems. But yeah, having, just having a home for it that's easy yeah. for them to find has been life-changing. Yeah, right. And that's, uh, for, for listeners, that's something that we provide through the Clinic Mastery Business Academy, uh, our done-for-you Google Hub with uh, all your policies, procedures as a cloud-based intranet. And Kate, is that something that you're able to set and forget or is it still a work in progress? Um, look, there are some aspects of it I set and forget. We changed our software about two or 12 months ago, no, a bit, mm -hmm. bit more. Um, and so when we changed our software, a lot of the processes that we had there whether the video right. recorded or step by step obviously need to be changed and I guess as the clinic evolves and we provide new services and you know we tweak our client experience and all of those things they all need to be updated as it happens but there's a large portion of it that definitely can be set and forget yeah yeah I love that so good really important insights to clinic growth there, Kate, but can you touch on, let's talk about you now. You've, you alluded to, you're a little bit ruinously empathetic at times and early days were maybe a little bit of a pushover. What are some leadership principles or lessons that you've learned along the way? Uh, I think at the end of the day, I have to remember that I am a business owner and I am leading this ship or driving this ship. And so I think, yeah, being, Sticking to my word is, is definitely something I've gotten better at. I used to, if someone ever kind of um or art about something I'd said, very quickly kind of, oh, maybe we can talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas now I'm very much, you know, no, that's the decision I've made and, you know, it's for the better of the team and the clinic. Um, and so that's what's happening. Yeah, without being, I guess, obnoxiously aggressive about it. Sorry right. to keep going back to... It's good. It's unbelievable. Radical candor. Um, yeah, I, I found that, that finding that balance between radical candor and sometimes being obnoxiously aggressive was also a fine line. So definitely being able to explain to the team, I guess, why we're putting something in place and how it affects them, how it affects the business, the clinic and the patients, you know, they kind of understand why that little bit better. And I think being able to lead by example in following the things that I'm putting in place has also been, um, yeah, really beneficial. So good. You've touched on so many principles that we can distill down there, that ownership of going, this is my ship and someone's got to stand up and lead it through to starting with why and helping our team understand this is not just what we're going to do, but this is why we do it. Uh, creating win-wins. I love it. That's, and I think through that, you know, if I can just brag on you for a second, you've been able to, <laughs> you've been able to stay true to yourself and you're still the bubbly bright Kate who has her style and her personality that people are really attracted to. And yet, for everyone watching from the outside, your leadership and stature, posture almost, has, has risen and grown uh, to create you know, what you dreamt of all those years ago, which now enables you to travel. And since then, you've been able to sell one of your clinics. So you had two locations, now back to one, yes. which, is, which is an awesome story. So 
firstly, tell us where did that, we're going to be uh, mindful of um, anonymity and privacy here, but where did that buyer come from? Were they just random out of the white pages? Or where did they come from? Um, no, so our little satellite clinic that we set up, um, I had a podiatrist working out there two days a week and at our current location, Greensboro location as well. Um, and she was a little pocket rocket and legend. She worked out there and yeah, helped me massively with that satellite clinic. We put a lot of the same things in place. We had our own intranet for that as well, because obviously different location, different poli well, not mm -hmm. policies, but different procedures and systems. And at one point or another, I kind of didn't feel like I had uh, all my ducks in a row. I didn't feel like I had enough control over the situation. And I offered the clinic to the podiatrist that I had out there um, at the location. At that point in time, it didn't suit her uh, where she was at. Um, mm -hmm. She was getting married and a lot of things were happening. And so it kind of just, just talked about and then taken off the table due to timing. I think the labor of everything happens for a reason. And then, yeah, uh, last year, yeah, it was, it was brought back up by the podiatrist that she maybe was at a different point in her life and was interested in, in taking over the clinic. And yeah, I, I think it made sense. I see a lot of me in that podiatrist as well. And I thought it was a really good opportunity for her. And I, I kind of feel like I was giving back. I, I had this awesome opportunity to buy a business that was two days a week. And there was so many things in, in this story that was kind of, mirroring up to what I was at, you know, six years ago. So mm. it just seemed like a bit of a no brainer to do it. So, yeah. Amazing. I love that. Again, testament to creating win-wins in a way that's obviously commercial for yourself, but creating pathways and opportunities and uh, to rise up someone from within, help them grow as a podiatrist clinically and create pathways that she was able to stick around and now fulfill one of, you know, probably one of the statements on her desire statement is absolutely unreal. What's that, what's that meant for you now, having sold a clinic? What's it meant for you personally? Um, I, don't, I didn't, didn't think I would have sold a clinic and bought a clinic by the age of 30, but <laughs> I did. So it kind of came as a bit of a surprise. Um, it was an interesting experience, I think, from day dot of us having the conversations of selling. We really wanted to maintain a friendship between the two of us, we'd worked alongside each other for a long time. Um, and that business relationship, I guess, had kind of become a friendship as well. As far as being able to sell the clinic, it also gave me that ability to refocus on my bigger clinic um, and the fact that, you know, there were some things that were there as well that I could refine, spend my energy and time back into that business. So it gave me that opportunity. Um, and yeah, it just was a bit of a, it made sense to do it. Mm. I love it. Tell me about the process. Was there anything that you didn't expect or looking back, you wish you knew through the process of selling a business? Not particularly. I think because I had bought under very similar circumstances, I guess I used that as my blueprint, mm -hmm. for lack of sure. a better word. So yeah, I, nothing really crept up and surprised me. Um, and I think because of both of us being quite open books, there was no real surprises or anything like that um, that popped up, which, yeah, I guess was probably a different scenario when I bought my business. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it was a really nice process. We've still been able to remain friends post um, the sale of the clinic. And, yeah, we're still very much in contact and use each other as soundboards all the time. So good. I love that. It's, it's such a different story to the, the rhetoric that we often hear of both parties being disagreeable and bitter afterwards. So, uh, you know, again, testament to your leadership to be able to navigate through that season and come out with win-wins for everyone all around. We touched earlier on about your travel. Let's talk about travels. Uh, firstly, top three destinations. Can you narrow it down? Um, I can, can if I have to. Cuba is definitely up there. It's probably one of my favourite countries I've ever visited. Peru is up there. It was probably the first South American country that I went to and mm -hmm. just fell in love with it. Oh, Jordan was pretty amazing, mm -hmm. um, which we've just come home from. So I'm still very much dreaming about Petra and yeah, all the beautiful, wonderful deserts there. So good. You know, like you mentioned at the top of the episode that we often get into 
business ownership or clinic leadership for more money, more time, more freedom, more travel, more time with family. But it's not the reality for so many clinic owners. They are bogged down. They feel like they're the bottleneck. And if they go away, the walls will crash and burn when they're gone. Tell it, I guess I want to touch on, firstly, has that happened for you? Have the walls caved in while you're away? No, the complete opposite. So the nearly nine weeks that I was just away for our clinic thrived. I was the bottleneck and nearly booked mm-hmm. a ticket straight back out of Australia when I got home because they all just stepped up to the plate and I think it gave them all that ownership. They realised that they could do things without me and that they yeah, had the initiative and their decisions were all decisions that I I would have made myself or approved if I was there. So it actually has made me stronger. I think the clinic's doing better than it ever has before. And yeah, MPS score was bigger when I came home, like better when I came home than before I left. Yeah. So maybe <laughs> so I am the problem. That's, um, that's a, a satisfaction measure for those playing along at home. Was that always the way though, Kate? What about early on when you travelled? Was there any walls crashing, in, crashing down? Not walls crashing down, but yeah, there was definitely um, more spot fires to put out when I came home. I remember coming home from a six-week holiday a couple of years ago and um, there was uh, two A4 pages of things that had either gone wrong or someone needed to talk to me about something that had happened while I was away. And this time, that definitely didn't happen. I, I remember so clearly coming home this trip and saying, you know, there was all the nice, how was your trip, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then I was like, yeah, really good. So what do I need to fix? And it was literally a nothing. And I had to, I was like, ha, good joke. Like, and no, there was literally not one thing that I needed to fix. Whereas retrospectively back to, you know, two years ago, yeah, I came home and there was, you know, a list of spot fires that had to be put out when I came home. Interesting. Very interesting. Tell me, do you ever get pushback from your team that you're not around much? No, not at all, actually. No? What, what, <laughs> what's their sentiments when you say, I'm going overseas for nine weeks? What's their reaction? Uh, I think the team sees the behind the scenes of being a business owner, solo business owner as well, I don't have a business partner. Um, mm-hmm. And it just, you know, your workload doesn't really ever stop. I am flicking emails off at sometimes 10 o'clock at night, you know, sending Slack messages while I think of them at that time as well. And I think the team realises and sees, I guess, the hard work that I put in and I guess the effort towards it being somewhere that people want to go to work, that they, yeah, they were like, go for it. You deserve it. When I told them I was taking nearly nine weeks. Mm. It's awesome. Uh, It really reflects my experience too. I've still got my clinics and still the solo owner and uh, the team, I think, I think clinic owners are so fearful of what their team might think that that leaves them hamstrung when the reality is at, when you've created a great culture and environment like you have, the team are willing to support your desire statement as much as you are theirs and, and champion and cheer it on when, um, when they see that coming to pass. So that's unreal. Talk to me about your rhythm. Are you taking holidays regularly? Is nine weeks just a random or... Is that every year, nine weeks? What does it look like? No, no. Well, nine weeks was, um, that was our honeymoon. Okay, so yeah. it was a little bit of a special one. Um, but we do generally try and take kind of alternate two weeks in the middle of the year, one year, and then a longer. Previously, it's been kind of six weeks um, leave. And this one was a longer one. So yeah, kind of if we go two weeks, six or five weeks, um, two weeks, uh, you know, repeat. Nice. And some yep. repeat. That's awesome. Uh, I know that um, inside the Business Academy, we're, we're just creating some more modules around holidays, rest and renewal time and how ho- getting away from your business actually helps it to grow. When you can get out of the way, you, you pressure test and you see what breaks, it allows you to come back and fix it. And it, it's a great litmus test of how well you are actually working towards your dream and vision of creating a clinic that supports your dreams and passions. So Uh, I I love that. And I would encourage listeners to think about how can you perhaps this time of year at the time of recording, we're coming close to Christmas now and perhaps next year, can you think about taking six weeks of renewal time, maybe go overseas, switch off. We're not talking business courses, but invest in your travels, in your family, in experiences, uh, because that's why we have a business to enable us to, to make a greater impact on our communities and for ourselves. And uh, Kate, I love that you're ex- an example of that. And, you know, I think in my experience too, when we book in travels, 
it means we've got to hustle and get the work done, right? So it, that things continue to tick over while we're gone. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it was really helpful in my journey to have that rhythm, I guess, set up because it wasn't a surprise to patients that I was going on holidays. You know, you hear of people who have had practices and clinics for 15 years and they've just taken their first five-week holiday. And, you know, that's not why I'm doing what I'm doing and it's not why I set out to do what I'm doing. So, yeah, I think it's, it's a good thing to set that rhythm when you can, early, as early as you can, really, because you're a human. Everyone else gets four weeks, leave a year. <laughs> why on earth should we have any less? And if not more, because of the Absolutely. time and hours that we put in towards, you know, our passion being our, our businesses. Love it, Kate. Can you give us a, a quick little snapshot into an average week in the life of Kate Heslop, clinic owner? What do you do? What do I do? Um, on a Monday, I have one-on-ones with my team and a PD session with our new grads. Um, it goes for an hour or two, hour, depend, two hours, depending on where we're at in the year. So at the moment, being towards the end of the year, we're down to an hour of PD time once a week. On the rest of my Monday, I meet with my mentor um, mm-hmm. and have a one-on-one with him. Um, and yeah, I guess figure out where the rest of my year is going. Other than that, we are about to open a shoe store as well. So there's been a lot of, you know, meeting with software companies to see their demos and those kinds of things as well. Tuesdays, I treat all day still, eight till Mm -hmm. five on a Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday, I'm currently supervising third year podiatry students at La Trobe. So that's my little give back, I guess. Um, And also see where the new grads are at and what they're currently learning and the most up-to-date research where that's at as well. It kind of gives me the chance to keep a finger on the pulse. Mm -hmm. Um, Thursday's back in the clinic, eight till five. And Friday's is Pilates at 10 o'clock. That's a new one this half of the year. Um, A bit of me time. And then a one-on-one back in the clinic. And then Friday afternoon, I'm either figuring out, um, I try and time block my time so that I can actually be as effective as possible. But most of the time it's either meeting with um, an allied health professional in our area or a referrer along with trying to plan for, yeah, the rest of the quarter. So good. Kate, you're a bloody legend. And uh, we've loved having you around the CM community uh, for an extended period of time now. And uh, yeah, you're a real testament to a hustler and someone who gets the work done and yeah, is, is really self-aware and open to growth. What's, what's next? Where do you see your clinic going in the next 12 months? The clinic, I think we will end up being in virtually capacity in the next 12 months, which is great, but bad at the same time. Um, So the clinic I can see, yeah, being at full capacity in the next probably six months, if I'm realistic, we're opening a shoe shop, like I said, so that's going to be a completely different ball game for me. Um, The world of retail, small business is very new and very scary. Um, So that's going to be probably my more of my focus, if I'm honest, in the next Mm -hmm. 12 months. And then I do still have a pie in the sky of having a secondary clinic somewhere within, you know, the demographic of where I live would be amazing. And that's definitely kind of on the agenda. I'm just trying to figure out location and yeah, whether I I start from scratch or buy something that's pre-existing. Um, Mm -hmm. There's definitely pros and cons to both, but that's kind of my next 12 year, probably 18 month projection. Yeah. Nice. I love it. I love it. And what about travel? Where are you off to next? I actually don't have any anything booked in I feel like I'm letting you down now I don't have anything booked in now um I there'll be a two-week holiday at some point next year um Mm -hmm. I do have a couple of team members who I definitely owe some (laughs) some leave to so um everyone's got their holidays in for next year and they'll make something work around those times for myself and my husband Adam will take a two-week holiday somewhere Mm -hmm. probably not quite as exotic but um yeah it'll definitely be two weeks leave in the next little while Brilliant. So good, Kate. Thank you so much for sharing and, and being open. We really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm sure listeners have been thrilled as they uh, listen to your journey. If people want to check out your clinic or your personal travel Instagram happenings, how mm-hmm. can they do that? Um, so our clinic is diamondvalleyfootandankleclinic.com.au. That's our website. And my travel Instagram is repeat. Um, so both of those are, yeah, at your disposal. Super. We'll link all that up in the show notes, listeners. You can head over to clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast, find the episode with Kate Heslop, and you'll find all the links and connections there. Kate, again, thank you so much. It's been an absolute blast having you on the podcast. Pleasure. Thanks, Jack. And listeners, thank you for tuning in. Make sure you head over to clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast, and we cannot wait to bring you another episode again really soon. Bye for now. 
Thanks for tuning in to the Grow Your Clinic podcast. To find out more about past episodes or how we can help you, head to www.clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast. And please remember to rate and review us on your podcast player of choice. See you on the next episode.